how the medical establishment found out what AIDS was and how it spread. Patient Zero was a man, the central victim and victimizer. And in a new book by reporter Randy Schultz, the scribe and historian of the epidemic, he opens with a startling new theory, a theory the epidemiologists, the medical detectives, believe. The AIDS epidemic may well have begun in the United States on our great weekend of celebration, the bicentennial in 1976, the festival in New York Harbor. Some of the celebrants took the disease that didn't even have a name yet home with them. The doctor detectives know that, they interviewed them later, after they were sick. It would take three years before the first cases of AIDS appeared, but even before AIDS emerged, many gays had major problems with sexually transmitted diseases that spread in and from the wide open bars and bathhouses. For the price of admission, bathhouses offered indiscriminate anonymous sex with multiple partners, a practice that would prove to be the key to the spread of the AIDS virus. In San Francisco, the city's Department of Health became expert in sexually transmitted diseases. The head of the infectious disease branch, Dr. Selma Dritz, now retired, was in charge of investigating the problem. We had uh, asked so many questions, and the main one was, how much sexual activity do you have? We would try to get very exact, and then we'd come up with 100, 250, 300, one man, swore it was 3,500 in the course of the last 10 years, and I, I challenged him on, he pulled out his calculator and showed me week by week by week. Well, if two men have 10 contacts, they're infecting 20. But in a couple of weeks, after those 20 become 40, and when you have 40 men passing it around to 10 each, you have 400 all of a sudden. So the curve went up like that. In 1979 and 1980, doctors in New York and California began reporting that gay men were dying mysteriously. There seemed to be nothing they could do about it. Randy Schultz, a gay himself, was hired by the San Francisco Chronicle to report on gay health problems. Mid-1981, a number of things happened at the same time. Doctors in Los Angeles noticed an unusual cluster of of uh, cases of a rare pneumonia among a group of gay men in Los Angeles. At the same time, doctors in New York City noticed that there was a rare skin cancer that was also appearing among gay men. They were identified separately, but within weeks, people at the Centers for Disease Control realized that there were two parts of the same phenomena, that what you had was, for the first time in the history of mankind, an epidemic of immune suppression that what linked these diseases was the fact that these men were losing their immune systems. Um, you've got to remember at the beginning it was very mysterious. Nobody knew what caused this. But there were two leading theories. Either it was a poison, perhaps a drug that these people were taking that destroyed their immune system, or the second and far more frightening theory that this could be a new infectious agent that was making its way through the gay community. It was the, the whodunit of the century in, in I was born nosy, and I enjoyed it very much. That was my job. It was hellish, and it was exciting, and it was wonderful, and I hated it. Hated it because? Because men were dying. Doctors don't have patients dying day after day after day, and two a day, and three a day after a while. You checked out things like vegetable shortening? We checked out all kinds of lubricants. We checked out what might have been used for uh, enemas before going out for an evening. We checked out what kinds of drugs we're using to give themselves a high. Drugs and lubricants were eliminated as possible causes. This suggested to Dr. Dritz and her colleagues at the Centers for Disease Control that their worst case scenario was the answer. A new and lethal infectious agent, a virus, was loose in the gay community. They surmised it was transferred during sex. The problem was to prove it because no one had isolated an actual bug in a laboratory. That would take another two years. So investigators from the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, began interviewing victims of the new disease across the country. Our people had contacts down in Kern County, in Laguna Beach, in New York, in uh, one from Montreal. After months in the field, the CDC detectives came back to San Francisco to Dr. Dritz to report their latest discovery. Well, they were having a tremendous excitement because three times with three different AIDS patients they had them name the same man as their contact, a very handsome airline steward. Patient Zero, 
is the name Dr. Dritz and the medical detectives used to describe this man, the airline steward, to protect his identity. Randy Schultz reveals that he was a French Canadian named Gaetan Dugas, patient zero. One of the first cases of AIDS, the first person identified as a major transmitter of the disease. It was through Gaetan Dugas that they realized AIDS was an infectious disease. By the time they were done with this study, which became known as the cluster study, they found that 40 of the first 248 gay men who got AIDS in the United States had either gone to bed with Gaetan or had gone to bed with somebody who had been to bed with him. With Gaetan, you get a horrible combination of circumstances. You get a guy who has got unlimited sexual stamina, uh, who's very attractive, so he has unlimited opportunity to act out that sexual stamina, and he's a uh, flight attendant for Air Canada, so he gets these flight passes so he can fly all over and have his fun, you know, in any number of cities. I mean, it was just a horrible combination of factors that helped really speed this disease into every corner of America. Bruce, he agreed to be interviewed if we did not use his last name, was one of Gaetan Dugas' many lovers. His story was typical. He was a very sweet, caring person. And um, I hadn't been out that long, and I wanted a relationship and thought this would, this person and I really hit it off. Good looking man. Very, I'd say. Bruce says he met Gaetan in Canada, and that later he came to stay with him in San Francisco. He came down here. He had friends out here, and he uh, had a key to come in and out. And um, so it was most, mostly we saw each other by notes until one night when I got off work early because I wasn't feeling well. Um, he came in with a friend, and um, I was so elated. I was going, oh, I finally get a chance to see him. And he goes, bye, hon. I'm going off to the baths now. And I was devastated. Bruce, who last saw Gaetan in 1979, says that so far he has been free of any symptoms. Dugas himself showed symptoms of a rare skin cancer in 1980. By the time that the Centers for Disease Control talked to him in early 1982, he had already been sick for almost two years. You said he was very cooperative with his yes. address book and so on, and he admitted uh, admitted all this. No, no, he was he was very helpful with the Centers for Disease. They couldn't have done this study as well as they did without his cooperation. Did they suggest to him that maybe he better ease up? Obviously, he's the first one who they're going to start saying, you know, maybe you should not have sex. And then that's where the sort of second and more troubling phase of Gaetan's story begins. I told him that we'd had reports from people who had seen him in the baths, really cavorting around, and then telling guys, huh, now you're going to get it too. You talked to him? I talked to him, yeah. You tell him to quit this nonsense? I told him that he was getting other people sick with it, and he said, it's my right to do whatever I want, my civil rights, I do as I please. I've got it, why shouldn't they have it? I can do as I please. I said, you can kill yourself if you want, but you've got no right to take somebody else along with you. And he said, screw you, and walked out. In the late 1970s and early 80s, 14 young men shared this summer house on Fire Island, east of New York City. At least two of them had been known to have sex with Gaetan Dugas. <coughs> Ten of the 14 men have now died of AIDS. Of the surviving four, one has the virus but no symptoms so far. The other three say they haven't been tested. Maybe they don't want to know. When those vacation buddies started dying, no one knew what they were dying of. And outside the gay community, no one seemed to care. There was a massive disinterest in doing anything for these awful guys that live this awful kind of life. In a strange professional way, was it good news when you began to find out that hemophiliacs were getting this disease, that drug addicts might get it, that it was not an exclusive gay plague? It was terrible, useful news, not good news. By the end of 1982, the public health doctors knew that AIDS was like syphilis before there was a cure, a 100% fatal venereal disease. At first, the gay community resisted the obvious prescription, changing its sexual practices. They were screaming civil rights. They were right. We didn't want them to lose their civil rights. But when it clashed with the public health, when it clashed with life and death, then you simply had to do something about it. I, I told them, what good are your civil rights if you're dead? Eventually, common sense and the mounting death toll prevailed. 
The bar scene calmed down and the bathhouses closed. But, says Schultz, while safe sex became dogma in the gay community, on a national level, in Washington, politics got in the way of protecting the public health. AIDS did not just happen. AIDS was allowed to happen. This disease did not emerge full grown on the biological landscape. And I don't think you will look to, I don't think you can look to medicine in order to understand how AIDS was able to spread so quickly across this country unimpeded. I think you have to look at the politics of AIDS. And when you get into the politics of AIDS, you look at one very unfortunate timing factor of this epidemic. AIDS was detected five months in to the first Reagan administration. And this administration had come in with one, you know, overriding commitment. And that commitment was to keep the lid on federal domestic spending. And consequently, during the first years of the epidemic, whenever there was a choice between do we go whole, whole hog against this epidemic or do we keep the lid on domestic spending, the Reagan administration invariably chose to keep the lid on health spending. The fact is that the files of the Reagan administration are redolent with the odor of smoking guns. April 12, 1983, the Secretary of Health and Human Services told Congress that AIDS was a number one priority and they had all the money they needed. On that same day, this man, Dr. Donald Francis, the man in charge of AIDS laboratory research at the Centers for Disease Control and a world-renowned expert on epidemics, wrote this memo to his superiors. The inadequate funding to date has seriously restricted our work and has presumably deepened the invasion of this disease into the American population. Dr. Francis pleads, in this vast and wealthy country, there must be a way to get 10 to 20 million dollars immediately for this disease. I stress speed because the usual government funding and spending processes are so slow as to be unacceptable in such an emergency situation. We tried to interview Dr. Francis, but he declined, citing the recommendation of his bosses in the government. The whole problem is that people are dealing with AIDS as a political problem instead of a public health problem. And in 1983, the politics were, let's hold the line on domestic spending. And so politics was allowed to triumph over public health. In 1987, the political question is, should we let a, political, a certain political version of morality triumph over what is good public health in educating people? And again, politics is triumphing over public health. Did the administration play politics with the public health? Well, whether they did or not. They certainly don't want to talk about their record to us now. First, we went to the Department of Health and Human Services. An official there agreed to an interview, but we were told his authorization was withdrawn. Then we went to the Office of Management and Budget, the arm of the administration that approves requests for AIDS money. They sent us to the White House. Here, a high official agreed to an interview, but at the last minute, his authorization was withdrawn. In the end, no one in the Reagan administration would talk about the politics of AIDS, past or present. People forget that all these delays in getting funding, these delays in getting decent education and prevention programs for AIDS, you don't measure those delays in weeks or months or years. You measure those delays in lost lives. Gaetan Dugas, patient zero, died of AIDS on March 30, 1984. As of October 1987, 24,947 Americans have died of AIDS, and experts estimate more than another 150,000 will die by 1991.